Ladies and gentlemen, we are really privileged to have once again Regina Zelinsky with us, honoring us with her presence. Good morning to all. I have introduced that I'm a survivor from Sobibor. My name is Regina Zelinsky. I was born in Poland and I was only a schoolgirl when the war started and we had a lot, a lot of things went since then. We were not allowed to go back to school because the school year in Europe starts in September and the war in 39 broke out. Just the 1st of September, the German told us we are having special schools, but we never had that. They only, you know, took us to work. It's a long story to, to talk. Here, you probably know all about it by now, from the, all of the schools to the colleges I went more than once, and it's a privilege for me to be here again. And in '39, when the Germans walked in, and then not straight away was everything so bad, because my parents remember from the First World War how the Germans were really civilized and good people, how they helped everybody in the war. And of a sudden, in 20 years, whatever turned out, they couldn't believe it. But it wasn't long after we had to leave for work, and the work was to straighten rivers. The rivers were flowing there for hundreds of years, but the Germans didn't like it. They didn't flow straight, they have to straighten them. And then, after that, it was the ghetto, remember, the 18th of May, 19. 19- 41, we never could go back home. We were taught a few streets for cordoned off, and we were in a ghetto. And we only May was spring, it was very warm. We never had anything with us. It was only what we were wearing, but we couldn't go back home. But we had very good people who tried to help us, like the engineer Kendratsky. He helped a lot of Jewish people make them, you know, from work, I don't know how, but we were even allowed to go home to clean the house, and then we got a little bit out from the from the house to where. And then not long after that was finished, and they said, now we are going to another place to do the same thing. That was a slave labor camp. From all of us, when we left that place, by the way, the 18th of May, when we came back from work, all the old people, the children, the sick people, whatever was left at home, they were not, not there anymore. We never knew what happened to them. And then the same thing happened the 22nd of October. It was almost very late autumn, cold. We have to 
go to another place. The farmers provided us with horse-driven wagon, and we were going to a slave labor camp named Staff. We didn't know then what it was, but we had to do the same thing. And when it was cold October, it was already late autumn. Sometimes we had to stand knee-deep in water to do all that. But that, we were only there for two months, from the 22nd of October to the 20th of December, 1942. And then the same thing, it was diminished. A lot of people died of hunger and diseases. We never had any doctors, any medicine. Nothing was provided there. And we left again to a place we didn't know where we were going. But on the way there, the wagons were all, some young people tried to escape on the way. They were very big oak forests, but they were caught and they were executed in front of us. And we were told, if you do that, that will happen to anybody who tried to escape. And it was about half day that was started off in the morning. In December, the whole world looked so beautiful, covered in snow, but on the way, we come to a crossroad, and one, one side went to left, went to hell, and to right to Vlodava. And when our transport turned to, to the right, my youngest brother was still, he was hiding there on the wagon. I don't know, he must have heard something. He came up with a say, let's say goodbye to the night because we won't see the sunrise. My mom asked him, what are you talking about? That you, it, there wasn't any explanation. He must have had something in the camp where we were hiding. And it wasn't, we arrived to a place called Sobibor. The place was lit like daylight and the Strauss's waltzes were playing. Anyhow, we had to get off. We were segregated, men to the one side and the woman on the other side. And I was still with my mom and my sister, and my younger brother was still there too, with, with me and another brother. There was a lot of other things happening there, but that's a little bit too, too long to explain. And then when we were standing there, one of, on a podium, a very tall assessment came along and he asked who can knit. And my mom pushed me out. She said, you are a good knitter. So another 12 of us were young people came along and we were taken to a barrack. The barrack didn't have anything in there, only a roof and, and, and uh, walls. Anyhow, we were huddling all together. It was very cold. In the morning, we were taken to a, a, to a place where there were heaps and heaps of shoes. And they were so good. One of the Shafirot, I didn't know the name then, but later I found out his name was Kam. Untasho Shafira Kam. He was so gracious. He wanted to give us better shoes. And he picked up a pair of shoes who were tied together. Then he, they were my sister's boots. He gave them to me. He said, in case you are not good. And then I realized what happened. That was the last time, the 20th of December, 1942, I saw my family. I was left alone in the world. We had to work there. And that was not a concentration camp, Sobibo. It was a death camp. Whatever was not pulled out for work, they were going straight to the guest chambers. Anyhow, it wasn't a very good welcoming, but we, like all of us, we wanted to survive, we wanted to live. I don't know how we survived with the rations. We used to say it's too much to live and not, and not enough to die or something like that. And we carried on the work. We had to knit a sock a day, we were giving not wool, but we had to undo a lot of the cardigans and jumpers from all the transports. And the transports were coming day and night, mostly trains. And it was, uh, and like, how shall I say, the trains were not uh, passenger trains. The only passenger trains were coming from France. 
and they were even dressed normally. They even had some luggage with them. All the other trains, when everybody had to get down, there were half of the people already dead and they are in screaming. And, and anyhow, we had, didn't witness that straight away because we were working somewhere else, but we got to know what was happening there. And it was a very big camp. We had three wire fences from the second and the third day where all the field was mined. And about a kilometer from that was a very big forest. And to make a little bit the story short, we worked there. How we survived with that food, it's hard to explain. After the spring came, we had to finish the knitting. We were taking out different places to work, even to the forest, because the young people had to cut the branches of the trees so a rider, a, a jerk, like on a horse, can ride through. So we had to take the, the branches in because they needed that for the crematorium. And after that, we were taken to different places to work. I even went taken to the sorting the <coughs> barracks, and the sorting was the clothes from the transport. The everything good was packed beautifully. That went straight to Germany, and all the others were left there. I don't know for, for what. After that, I was taken to another place, to, to, to the laundry. And in the laundry, I wasn't so well, but they didn't need their sick people because the sick people was taken straight away to the third camp and we never saw them back or they were shot somewhere. Especially we had a Sturmbandführer, Gustav Wagner, and he was, I can't describe him, I couldn't call him that he was an animal because an animal doesn't kill for nothing. An animal is either defending themselves or they are hungry. But that Gustav Wagner walked around with a big Alsatian dog and whatever didn't even take off the cap right when they don't work or didn't work properly or didn't walk properly. Everybody was shooting them. Even when they didn't get up in the morning properly to jump off, he took them out. We had only shots from him and it, it was always we lived in fear, but it was always from minute to minute we were living in Sobibor. And then that was the 26th of September, a very big, 42, a very big transport of Russian prisoners of war arrived to Sobibor. They were still in their military uniform, and amongst them was a, their lieutenant, Alexander Pechersky. Anyhow, we called him because in Russian, Sasha, Alexander is Sasha. And he saw what was going on in that camp. And he, but there was already people, men who was trying to organize escape because if one person escaped, they used to catch them in the forest, brought them back. And we had to witness the prosecution sometimes of 10 or 12 other people for one. And they'd say the one who started to organize something. We can't allow anybody to escape singly. We either go all or not at all. In with Alexander Pechersky, there was a lot of, with him, other uh, Russian prisoners of war, and they had military experience, and with somebody in the camp, a couple of other people, they tried to, to do something, we are going to escape. They were always waiting that the Commandant Reichsleitner and Wagner was gone for the holiday, and they worked it out. We, us women working there, we were separate. We worked out only a night before, we were told, from after the work, when we go back for the roll call, and we are going to walk out the mine gates. We couldn't walk out anywhere else because the fields were mined. And then there was a little bit too far to run to the, to the forest. But something happened a couple of minutes before, and the alarm was risen, and the shooting starting. We couldn't escape anymore through the mine gate. And some of the young people did cut holes in the in the, in the fences, a lot got killed running from the mines in the shooting. I don't know how I was working then in a sewing room 
outside in the German quarters. I wasn't well and I was so happy that I got there. I would not survive anywhere else because I was beaten up once. I wasn't working fast enough. And anyhow, when we were running, all I could see is to run forward. I don't know what will happen. I didn't tread on a mine. I was not so far from the forest. I just stopped for a second. And I thought it doesn't matter anymore what will happen if I got shot, shot from the back. That would be a merciful death. I don't have to go to the gas chambers. And I was stopped for a second. And I took a very deep breath. I was breathing free air. I managed to get away. I got to the forest. And from there on, the planning, it's a long story, and I haven't got that much time, but you probably did read about it in the book, and there is a, a film <coughs> was made in 1985, Escape from Sobibor, and that tells you the whole story. You can get that now in DVDs, and the books are out, and the books are, you know, on, on the web, and all that, and from there on, I made my way home, and people helped me there, Polish people. I couldn't hide there, they want me. But in Poland, when they find a Jewish person in a Polish uh, family or a Catholic family, the whole family was executed. In the other parts of Europe, when they found a Jew and not in a Jew place, they were taken to concentration camp. And they were such good friends, I couldn't do that that they would hide me. I said, if you just help me to get away as a family, how is that in English? You know, as a worker to Germany, because a lot of Polish people were running away. They didn't want to go. The, the Russians were coming or something to, to Germany for work. And they, that was the best place for me, too. And they helped me. A person came along there, and she saw me. She said, I'll give you my daughter. That was a very good friend of mine from school. I'll give you my daughter's birth certificate. And from that moment on, forget that you are Jewish. You are a Polish Catholic girl. And go to Germany, and that will help me. Another Polish family gave me the clothing, and she gave me money and an address that her niece is still in Germany, and I knew her niece a little bit older. Uh, she's already working, and that was just like a passport to go, and I made my way to Germany. It's a long story how I made There was always little, little miracles where I thought I'll never get through anymore. There was always a flicker of light on the end of the tunnel, and I made it. I made it from Poland, from Lublin to Frankfurt, a mine on the other side of Germany. How I got through there, but on the way they were uh, air raids because the, the Americans were bombarding Germany in daytime, the English at night, and the air raids were always there in Berlin. I had to get out because there was an air raid. And there were other places, you know, but I made it. I made it to Frankfurt when I came there. And they, they, you know, didn't know where to go, but I had some money, the people, the poor, the helpers gave me money, and I changed it over for marks, and I made my way. I was in Frankfurt. And then it was Saturday, and in Frankfurt, in Germany, the people were working only till lunchtime, but there was somebody there who I asked, how can I get to an employment office? They told me with tram number one. I got to the employment office and I had the papers with me. I had the address and all that. My papers was only the birth certificate in the address of Frankfurt. And they said it's all closed. And man, man, they, they are going to look for the people. I've got the address to and I, they, I was told that they, that place has been bombed and that, that place has been 
transferred from Car Frankfurt to Castle. But when I was there, that man who took me, he could speak Polish in that employment office, and he said he has to visit a friend. A man with his friend came down, a little boy came down with about four years old, and uh, could I stay there till Monday because they had somebody from the army and she had to leave. I said, I can't speak German, what can I do? That, that it will be all right. And this little boy grabbed me by the hand and put me up uh, to his room. And there he started to talk. I knew a little bit of German because my parents could speak it. And yeah, in a little bit, the, the old Jewish language has a lot of words, but a little bit close to German. And I made my well up and I stayed there till the end of the war at Frankfurt and look after that little boy, the way he told me the German language. I, I better tell it because it's so... From a four years old boy, he put in the kitchen table all the utensils in the kitchen, and he told me in German and that I have to remember that's a, a, a cup and that's a glass and that's a, that's that and that. And if I had to go around and make my way, and if I made a mistake with one, I have to start all over again. And then in about six weeks, I was speaking fluent German, and I stayed there till the end of the war. And then the, the, I was beautiful day, liberated, the 27th of April, 1945. The Americans came into Frankfurt. Anyhow, from there on, the Americans were getting it all, all away, you know, from the camps. It was transit camps in, in one camp. It was Wetzlar, a very, very big city. And we were about 1,000 there from all over Europe, sections of the camp had for different countries. And then the migration started to, to where will we go? I couldn't go home because there was nothing at home to go to, for I was left in the world all alone. Can you imagine? I wasn't even 20 years old. And I didn't have a name. I didn't have a a home, I didn't have a family, I didn't even have a country where to go. But the Americans helped us a lot. And it wasn't long after we were starting to think to migrate. And I wanted, I wasn't well enough straight away, but I made it through. I was once, you know, I had one kidney had to be removed because I was beaten up in that camp. Anyhow, five months in hospital, but that I, I survived. I'm here. And after that, when the Australian government had people mm. there, like doctors and other, uh, to, to see, to uh, look for migrants who are healthy enough and good enough to come over to Australia. And yeah, I married in 1945. My son was born in 1947, and he was two and a half years old. The Australian government accepted my family, my husband and my son and myself, and we left for Australia from Germany. We went through Austria to Italy from Naples, the ship, a very prefabricated military ship, and that was called the Castelblanca. And we made it to Australia. It took about a month. We went through the island of Capri. I remember the sunset of the island of Capri, where the ship went through the, to the, the, uh, on the ocean. And from there on, and we were not so lucky. We had a bit of stormy ride to to Australia. I arrived in Sydney the 3rd of August, 1949. So I'm an old Aussie. I was naturalized in 1957. So I'm a really old Aussie with an accent. I can't help that. And we made our way from Sydney on. But there was another thing from Sydney. We, we got on a train. The train was going to Batos. And Batos is of the foot of the uh, Blue Mountains. 
and we arrived in battles. The whole world was covered in snow, the 3rd of August, or that was maybe the 4th of August then. And we thought we were going to a semi-tropical country. What is the snow doing there? But we found out very quickly what the snow was doing there. And after that, we were taking for work. My husband, my husband had to f sign a contract with the Australian government. No profession was asked, but he was given a job, and I was taken to, to a camp because my son got sick when we were landing there, and he had to be in hospital in, in, in Batos. And two years had the husband, they had to work whatever the government was putting. I didn't have to go to work because I had a child to look after. And slowly, slowly, we never, we were so happy to be in Australia. First of all, when I got off the ship, I kissed the ground to be free. And nothing matters. It was a very hard, hard beginning, not knowing the language, indifferent, everything was different, but still we were blessed God every day of every minute of the day that we are free people and from there on we started to get together, we bought a block of land and we built a house somewhere else and then you know my daughter was born in 1958 uh, just a year after we were naturalized so she's a real Aussie and the years sometimes fly, I found myself a job, I couldn't go to a factory, I found myself a job doing sewing. First of all, it was for baby clothes, and later on, I worked for 26 years in a dressing gown place. And we somehow, you know, made our life here. And my husband passed away in 1986, my son, moved over to Adelaide because he wanted to finish the studies here. He was already married, and my daughter got married too, and she went to Tasmania, and I was just alone in Sydney. And one day, Andrew, my son, came over and said, Mom, how about coming to Adelaide? I used to visit him very often, and I was all alone. I said, why not? I loved Adelaide. I came here 18 years ago from Sydney, 45 years in Sydney and 18 years here. And I was the happiest person to come here to work. And then I retired and I joined here when I arrived. I joined the Progressive Synagogue. And that, that, that was my second home. And there I started to go to schools because when we were escaping, and the escape wasn't that it's going to be safe, Pechersky got on a box and he said, now everybody for themselves, but remember, even if one survived, the escape is going to be a success because you'll be able to tell what was happening in Sobibor. And that was got me through. I'm alive and I have to do something about it. And I've been here in South Australia only to 39 schools, colleges, and universities all together. The list in the cards, in the letters, I still have got it, and I'm going to put them all together, and I'll make up a little book about it. And my son has already thought about it. How are you going to call it? I said, I don't know. And he said, that's going to be called the sparks from the ashes. And that is coming along slowly, but it's coming along. And I would like to thank you all and bless you all with good health and God's blessings and all the best. But one thing is don't forget the knowledge what you acquired at schools, in high schools. Nobody can take that away from you. You will never lose it. You might lose a book or a pen or, or even a jumper but your knowledge will always be there and put it to work. Do the best for Australia because you are young and you have got a lovely free country and you have to cherish it. So, my dearest young people, students and teachers, thank you very, very, very much for being here. You've been so kind 
to listen. And God bless you with good health and, and joy and laughter. And then be friendly to one another because friends are better than relatives. How do they, they say that in Australia? Friends you choose, but with, with relatives you are stuck. I wish I had a relative, but I haven't got any. But all the people I know, they are my relatives. I, that's like being in a free country and grew up there. That's how it goes. And cheers. <laughs> Thank you very, very much.